Talk from the NURSA Championship Series from Florida State University in Tallahassee. I'm David Peters. And here in Gainesville, I'm Marty Dempsey from the University of Florida. On this edition, questions and answers. In fact, lots of answers to those questions you've been sending in over the last couple of weeks through our email and through our website. We're going to get to those. But first, I wanted to recognize some key leaders with the series this year, and those are our committee chairs. They've got all their work ahead, so let's recognize them now as they work with other of our member volunteers. Leading the flag football committee this year is Gerard Davis from Ohio State University. Leading the soccer work team is Laura Thomas from the University of Alabama. Gary Cahan will lead our tennis committee. It'll be Drew Cantwell from LSU leading the club basketball committee. From Cincinnati, Jeff Logsden will lead our national and regional basketball committee. On the brand management side is O.C. Wheatfall from Texas A&M University. Arian Judy from Notre Dame leads student and professional development. The assessment team welcomes back April Flint from Emory. And Kelly Rockwell from Georgia Tech will lead our standards committee. And of course, plenty of other NURSA members are on board to volunteer to work with the series this year and a number of those different committees. So thank you to all of our volunteers who will join our committee leaders this year to do some tough work. Hey, we've got this expert over here sharing the screen with me and sharing this podcast, Marty Dempsey, as our second vice chair. Well, you're the expert and going to be providing a lot of answers to the questions we've been sent in. I'm sure you've gotten some help right along the way to get these answers together. Expert's very loose, but certainly the messenger for the day. <laughs> Sounds good. Well, Without hesitation, let's get right into some of those questions because we had some great ones come in. We're going to answer a few today. I know we've got some more for another podcast, but let's start with a question about bridge students. Uh, sometimes some of our teams are looking to bring in students who don't exactly fit the correct mold or the exact mold that you know, a university student would be. How does someone with bridge students or something else uh, for their team approach this series about their eligibility? Sure, absolutely. And many of our sport club associations that our sport clubs are a part of face very similar challenges. So it's important for us to remain very mobile with how we uh, assess these types of students, whether it be virtual students or bridge programs, as, as this question states. Um, we have to evolve our policies to make sure that they are always inclusive, consistent, and fair. Now, in the past, some on one-off cases, we've had appeals that have been submitted um, and have been granted in the past for some of these bridge students from certain universities. So that can already be done. But overall, an overarching concept is going to be worked on by the standards work team, led by Kelly Rockwell, of course, from Georgia Tech, um, to look at potential new eligibility requirements for these students this coming year. So more information on that soon. Sounds good. Well, and one of the things we heard very positive comments about uh, from our members was the student officials experience and the volunteer experience at our various regional and national events. But one thing people were concerned about was the participants experience. You know, they're the ones putting out the money. So you know, what efforts is the series look at, looking at to be undertaken to really enhance the participant experience? Absolutely. As you mentioned, the series has done, you know, some really great work over the years when it comes to volunteerism from staff and student officials. Uh, you can actually see some research that's out now from Tingle, Hazlitt, and Flint um, that talks about some of those direct impacts that we get from volunteering at series events. But as you mentioned, what are the question, uh, the question on people's minds is what about our participants? How do we positively impact them? This year at our Swamp Shootout Tournament, I had the opportunity to, uh, to meet with a few of our uh, a few of our participants as part of a little focus group uh, and they had commented that some of the regional tournaments this year including Swamp Shootout had the, uh, the new Gatorade sponsorship uh, that had come. Gatorade was here giving out some free swag. They loved that. So they loved the idea of getting some free things, being able to walk away with some takeaways from, the, from our tournaments. They also talked about having an easy registration process, that that's part of the participant experience even before they get on our campuses. And then of course on people's mind is, is keeping it affordable. And, and I know with some of the folks in that room and discussed maybe 20 25 dollars a person for a basketball team it was somewhere in the two to three hundred dollar range that they felt was the most comfortable to be able to participate at the regional level now at the national level we are certainly finding a balance between hosting those great opportunities for staff that the, you know what really keeps the tournament going me and you got started in this field a lot, a lot in a lot of ways because of the nurse championship series and these regional events um, to the balance between our student officials and their training and then this participant experience. It is a series priority, and you're going to see that out as, in our next month's episode when we reveal the series 2.0. It's what we've talked about quite a bit is how do we enhance the, um, the whole experience from beginning until they leave campus with us, and even after that with the assessment pieces for our participants. So much more to come with this. 
indeed. Lots of information to come. We look forward to covering some of that in our next episode as well. And one place we're not having a problem with teams, at least, is in soccer. I mean, 96 teams at the national tournament last year in Arizona, similar numbers the year before that in Alabama. So lots of folks want to play soccer. You, what are we looking at within this series for, for options to be considered to better accommodate this overwhelming demand of teams that are looking to participate in the NURSA National Soccer Championships? Yeah, absolutely. Soccer has received tremendous support from the national level. Uh, but there, that doesn't mean that there's not still suggestions out there about how we can improve that experience. One suggestion that came in from a member was separating it, but maybe divisions, you know, call it one, two, and three, or, you know, where maybe the size of your school or past performance dictates, you know, what division you are in to, uh, you know, give maybe more teams a chance to, to walk home with the prize. Uh, I know soccer has already has their championship bracket and their open division championship where you're actually qualifying for that bracket and then a lottery system as you had mentioned for for this open for these open teams so um, in the future we, we're looking forward to inviting some of the members on the soccer work team on to talk about a lot of the exciting happenings um, with um, the sport of soccer overall uh, whether that be with the mentorship the new mentorship program that started out to get student officials more involved at the national level uh, Eric Jakey we welcome him to the team this year as, as the new uh, officials director at the national level. That's going to be some really exciting times for us. So uh, Laura Thomas and her team that is very passionate about soccer, they, uh, they have really worked to move the needle on that program overall. We're really happy with where soccer stands. Well, and it's doing great in the fall with the 96 teams. And I know it's so hard just to pack any more into the couple of days we've got in the field space that's available. But one thing I've noticed is some new spring opportunities. Marty, can you talk a little bit about that, that we can get our club teams involved maybe in the off season uh, yep. for some more opportunity to play soccer? Yeah, so many of our sport clubs have an on-season and off-season, right? And a lot of them are happening in the spring, but soccer is one of those that, you know, happens right away. So how do we help continue to engage our soccer teams throughout the entire spring semester? Well, we, we talked about having these uh, these new regional tournaments. And the University of Illinois hosted one last year. Great success there. Learned a lot from it. Want to continue to expand on that. And it was another great venture to get our student officials involved in regional and national soccer. So really looking forward to that and, and how we can continue to engage folks year round so they don't have to wait once December hits where you're not waiting until all the way till the next following September before you get to play competitive soccer again. Shifting gears a little bit, I, we, you talked about our experiences as volunteers at tournaments, and we have so many members who want to be engaged in what the series is doing. So, uh, Marty, can you address a little bit how the series can help ensure the widest range of NURSA members have the opportunity to volunteer at, at our, series, our series regional and national events? Sure. Yeah, a variation of this question is on the mind of many um, of our stakeholders within the series. Um, you know, we're trying to find that balance again of the people that have, you know, quote unquote, carried the mail for this, uh, for the NURSA Championship Series over the past 12 years um, versus getting those new opportunities for students and professionals to break in and be a part of a committee and get those same leadership opportunities that I know were afforded to so many of us, including you and I, Dave. Um, at the national level, over the past few years, we've seen some pretty cool successes with this. At the, ba uh, the, the basketball um, work team has created this new leadership model that has infused some new talent into leadership positions within that. I know the flag football work team led by Mark Comer over the last couple of years has been working on some flag football position descriptions um, to, again, um, enhance some opportunities for both veteran and new, um, uh, new staff members. Uh, soccer, we have seen some turnover there. Of course, we mentioned Eric Jakey. We also have a new uh, operations um, director uh, on the soccer side. So I think you're starting to see some of that and some intentionality is being given to that as, a, as the Nursing Championship Series as a whole. At the regional level, I really do believe that it's going to be about communication and collaboration. Uh, it's a good thing that our, that our host schools have the autonomy to be able to select the staff. It doesn't go to the work team. It doesn't go to the executive board. Our host committees do a great job of making sure that they get compile a staff that best meets the needs for their tournament. We want to continue that and allow that, uh, that level of autonomy. So, but how do you work through that when you have a region such as Region 2 for flag football this year that has four different regionals? Can we communicate and collaborate more to make sure that maybe the same person isn't the officials director, the all tournament director at, you know, three or four of those tournaments where maybe it's a better option to have multiple people getting that leadership opportunity and just expand, expand our base of that knowledge. So uh, 
communication, collaboration um, between those regionals, uh, but keeping that autonomy is going to be really important. Well, you brought up flag football right there, Marty, and flag football has been the mind of a lot of our uh, questioners uh, and a lot of the questions I'm looking at now is because we've taken a look at some numbers, trends that are up and they're down in some areas. I mean, we've got four regional tournaments in Region 2, but not a single host site in Region 3 this year. So how is the series looking into really flag football? Yeah, sure. You know, flag football, you know, one of those, one of those uh, sports that has been, you know, around for the series forever, you know, many of us got our start in it. So there's some, still some really great things that are happening in flag football, but we also know that there's some challenges out there. And the fact of the matter is this year within region three, there was no applicants um, for that regional tournament. They've had, you know, the, that area of the country has had to cancel some tournaments in recent years. And I don't think anybody is really happy about that. Like you, we've, you know, I know that there's a lot of passionate stakeholders. The chair of the editorial board comes from Region 3. A lot of other really great flag football minds and institutions that have supported regional and national tournaments come from that area. So we really do need to get together to find out how we can infuse some new energy within flag football um, at the regional level so we don't have that issue again where we have an entire area of the country that is uh, not represented um, with our regional tournaments this year. Well, Marty, I would hope that, you know, nothing's not on the table. I, you know, it could even be scheduling. And one suggestion we received was to think about perhaps a springtime uh, tournament as opposed to trying to compete with the holidays to do a national tournament. So perhaps that's one thing that they'll get looked at and maybe some others. Yeah, yeah. That was a really interesting suggestion that came through. Uh, you know, traditionalists, you know, yeah, me and you, we come from this, right? We, we, we were used to, back in the day, you would come to the National Flag Football Tournament, it'd be right around the holidays, it would be, you know, part of that holiday break. Everybody would get together, New Orleans or Pensacola or wherever it was held at, and, and that's just the way it's been for many years. But now is it a reality that we take a look at this? Now, most of our institutions host seven-on-seven -seven flag football in the fall semester. That's not the case for everybody. So is there an opportunity that if you move that to later in the spring, in March, April timeframe, do we move the national championship around? It's been in Texas, Florida, and New Orleans pretty much exclusively for 20-plus years. If you move it out of that where it's not – team degrees, you know, in December and January, do you have the opportunity to, to impact different areas of the country? So I'm not saying that that's the best solution, but it's certainly an interesting thing that I don't know has been considered all that much, um, you know, within flag football. Lots of variables to look at with flag football and many of the things that they're working on in the series. In fact, a number of questions we didn't get to today. I just want to mention a few that we look forward to answering in a future episode of Series Talk. I know professional development of our volunteers and, and tournaments is one that's on the mind. Uh, Marty, what about you? Any other questions that you looked at that you look forward to answering soon? Sure, absolutely. I know people want to talk about the registration process. I mentioned a little bit earlier. People want to talk about sponsorships. There's still a lot of flag football questions on the board, you, you know, when it comes to, you know, sport clubs or just numbers overall. Uh, assessment is a, is a big topic within the, um, within the minds of our stakeholders. So there are still many of different challenges and questions out there. Uh, but also a lot of really great things that the series is doing. So we, we hope to hit on all of that as we continue the series talk. Hey, plenty more to talk about. That's job security. It means more episodes for us. So <laughs> looking forward to those. But on the next episode of Series Talk, which will come out in August, we'll have a complete report on the work of the Series 2.0 Task Force, what they accomplished at their summit in Atlanta back in June. And one of the key takeaways with, with the summit and the leaders that were there was our long-term vision for this series. You know, what do we think it needs to do and how do we need to get to where we want to go in the next three to five years? We've got principles and promises and priorities and purpose, and we'll cover all of that in our next edition of Series Talk. But that's it for this edition. From Florida State, I'm David Peters. And I'm Marty Dempsey from the University of Florida. Thanks for joining us this time. This is Series Talk from the NURSA Championship Series and NURSA, Leaders in Collegiate Recreation.